Um, one of the, as I mentioned, one of the great partners from the Dallas Federal Reserve is the president, uh, Robert Stephen Kaplan. Robert has served as the 13th president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas since September 8, 2015. He represents the 11th Federal Reserve District on the Federal Open Market Committee in the formulation of U.S. monetary policy and oversees 1,200 employees of the Dallas Fed. He was previously the Martin Marshall Professor of Management Practice and Senior Associate Dean, the part I love the most, at Harvard Business School. He's the author of several books, including What You Really Need to Lead, The Power of Thinking and Acting Like an Owner, What You Really Meant to Do, A Roadmap for Reaching Your Unique Potential, and What to Ask the Person in the Mirror, Critical Questions for Becoming a More Effective Leader and Reaching Your Potential. Rob, I'm waiting for the How to Lead an Academic Institution book. <laughs> Prior to joining Harvard in 2006, he was vice chairman of the Goldman Sachs Group with global responsibility for the firm's investment banking and investment management divisions. He became partner in 1990 and served as co-chairman of the firm's partnership committee. He was also a member of the management committee. Following his 23-year career at Goldman Sachs, he became a senior director of the firm. He serves as chairman of Project ALS and co-chairman of the Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, a global venture philanthropy firm that invests in developing nonprofit enterprises dedicated to addressing social issues. He's a board member of the Harvard Medical School. He previously served on the boards of State Street, Harvard Management Company, Bed Bath & Beyond, and Hydric and Struggles International. He was also trustee of the Ford Foundation, co-founding board chair of the Teak Fellowship, co-founder and chairman of Indaba Capital Management, and chairman of the Investment Advisor Committee at Google. Beyond that, I will say uh, many, why many of us always love to hear from Rob, I think he has a gift for taking things that are hard and complicated and distilling them into, into ways that, that we can all understand. Uh, so with that, thanks to Rob, and please join me welcome. Uh, welcome, everyone. We're glad to have you at the Dallas Fed. I always ask this question. How many of you are here at the Dallas Fed for the first time? All right, that's great. Good. Uh, we, well, what we've been trying to do is open up uh, the Federal Reserve, take away a little bit of the mystery, and, uh, and open up uh, this bank to the community all through the state. Uh, you heard from Darren uh, Peschel, who's one of the, uh, the proud U UT alums, but Darren is one of the great uh, leaders we have in the Federal Reserve System, runs our Houston branch, and so I know you're thrilled to have him as an alum, but we're thrilled to have him as a leader at the Fed. And I will tell you, we've gotten to know Jay, Jay Hartzell, uh, ever since I arrived in Texas, I think you were a senior associate dean at the time, and we compared notes then, but boy, I've watched him as dean of this school, and he's done an incredible job. So congratulations on all you've done, Jay. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit this morning, very briefly, uh, about the outlook for the U.S. economy, talk about some of the structural drivers affecting the U.S. economy, uh, and then say a word about the energy business and also a little bit of a word about Texas. And I'm going to do all that in about 15 or 20 minutes. And so, and then we'll take questions later. So let me just get right into it. Uh, our outlook at the Dallas Fed is that the U.S. economy will grow at about two and a, two and a quarter percent this year. So solid growth. Um, if it weren't for the coronavirus situation, which I'll talk about in a moment, and the Boeing situation, which we think alone will, uh, in the first and second quarter, take as much as four-tenths of a percentage point off GDP growth, I'd probably have even a firmer forecast for the outlook for this year. Uh, we, we think we're going to have solid growth. So why is that? Um, first of all, we were a little bit challenged last year, 2019, by three things. One, global growth has been as weak uh, is it, it was as weak last year as it's been since 2009. A lot of that had to do with trade and trade uncertainty. Uh, and because we have signed a phase one deal with China, it doesn't remove trade issues with China. I think they're going to go on for years, but it's better than the alternative, which would have been escalation. Uh, in addition, we've now ratified USMCA, uh, which we think is a good modernization from NAFTA. But again, it, it's better than the alternative, which would have been uncertainty and escalation with Mexico. And there's a little bit more certainty uh, and predictability about what's going to go on with the UK and Brexit. So when you wrap all that up, those three things we think had been dragging down global growth. And just to give you an idea, exports are 12 percent of US GDP. They're 47 percent of German GDP. They're in the 20s for Asian GDP. And so Trade really is highly correlated with global growth, and the fact we have a little bit more stability 
uh, we hope will lead to a little bit more uh, trade stability, will lead to more stability in global growth this year. The other thing we struggled with last year related to weak global growth is manufacturing in the United States was as weak as it's been since 2009. We think that's directly related to trade uncertainty and, and global growth. So we expect that to stabilize a bit this year. And then the other thing uh, that we struggled with last year as an economy is business fixed investment was sluggish. Basically, didn't increase much at all. Uh, we don't think it's going to be. Uh, we don't think it's going to be that much better in 2020. But again, we think because a little bit less uncertainty for business people, we think we'll have a little bit of a stabilization in business fixed investment. One of the reasons why business fixed investment isn't going to improve more is, uh, which I'll talk about in a couple of moments, is the energy business. We think capex in the energy sector is going to be negative this year, and it's hard for business fixed investment in the United States to be a big positive number when energy is actually negative because it's such a big part of business fixed investment in the United States. Now, when you combine stabilization in global growth, manufacturing, and business fixed investment with a strong U.S. consumer, that's enough to give you two, two and a quarter percent growth. Uh, and just to give you an idea, the consumer is 70 percent of the U.S. economy. Um, I was worried last year that if global growth had weakened more, manufacturing had weakened, and business fixed investment had gotten weaker, it would seep in to other parts of the economy and the consumer would ultimately get weaker. But I think we've stabilized, and so we think we're going to have a solid uh, year, year of, uh, of growth in 2020. Um, so let me jump to a uh, second question, which I'm often asked. Okay, you two, two and a quarter percent. Turns out, if you measure since 2010, the average growth rate in the United States since 2010 has been around 2%. You're getting used to hearing that number. And so then the question is, why isn't it better? Uh, we, we have pretty big uh, uh, deficit spending on the fiscal side from the U.S. government, for better or for worse. And so that should be stimulative. You've got, on balance, I think, an accommodative Fed, which we can talk more about in the Q&A. Why aren't, we, why aren't we growing faster than this? And so let me give two reasons why, because they're going to be problems for the, or challenges for the future. They're also opportunities. Number one issue, uh, uh, demographics in the United States are such the population is aging. I wish we weren't, uh, but we are. It's a reality. And because of that, workforce growth is decelerating in the United States. And just to give you a little bit of an idea by comparison, in the 70s, if some of you can remember back to the 70s, I certainly can, uh, U.S. workforce growth was about two and three quarters percent on average during that entire decade, okay? It went down to about 2% in the 80s. It got down to one and a quarter, one and a half percent in the 90s. In the 2000 to 2010 period, it was a little below 1%. From 2010 to 2020, it dipped down to about a half of 1%. And from 2020 on, it's our view at the Dallas Fed that workforce growth in the United States is going to be about a quarter of 1%. OK? So GDP, you've heard me say this before, is made up of growth in the workforce plus growth in productivity. And so the first component is decelerating. And uh, this, is, this helps explain why the participation rate, which is the percentage of 16-year-olds and above that are in the workforce, either actively working or either working or actively looking for work, has been stuck around 63% over the last three or four years. It was 66% in 2007. And we think it's been a good accomplishment just to keep it flat at 63%. And it's our view that in the next 10 years, that percentage will likely dip down to about 61%. All that translates into is if workforce growth is slower, that's a headwind for GDP growth. Now, country's done a number of things to supplement workforce growth, which has helped GDP since the 70s. One, we have an increasing percentage of women entering the workforce. People are working longer. Uh, you hear, this helps explain why you're hearing a lot of talk on child care. You're reading a lot about child care benefits and improving child care benefits and transportation availability because it means people not in the workforce are more likely to get in and stay in the workforce if they have a way to get to work and if they have child care. Uh, 
And, and, and we need those policies because we need more people uh, in the workforce. Uh, the other uh, topic, which is a sensitive one, but we do a lot of work on it at the Dallas Fed is immigration. Immigration has been a key part of workforce growth in the United States, and particularly, we'll cite the statistic. It's our estimate that 50% of the workforce growth in the United States over the last 20 years are immigrants and their children. And over the next 20 years, we think that percentage will likely be closer to 100%. How do we know that? Because we know that native-born workforce growth is going to be negative. And so we do a lot of work on immigration. It's sensitive. We're careful about how we talk about it. But we have done a lot of work to suggest that we would be well served in the United States to restructure our immigration system to be much more like Canada's, for example, that's more employer-based and skill-based. Uh, but we also point out, for those who think we can cut immigration as a policy, and grow GDP, as you've heard me say before, those two things don't go together. Uh, it's, we need workforce growth if we're going to grow faster. So the other big issue then is productivity. You'd like to think with all this technology investment and, and, uh, and AI and other things that are coming, we could offset workforce growth with just you know, more productivity. So here's the productivity statistics. Uh, in the 90s, uh, uh, productivity growth in the United States was about um, uh, 2% on average per year. It dipped to 1.5% from 2000 to 2010. And since 2010, productivity growth in the United States has been on average less than 1% a year. So a lot of you say, and, and when I came to this job, I said, that can't be right. It must be a measurement error, some other kind of problem, because that doesn't make any sense. Every industry I look at is more productive, yes? But what we think is going on is there, uh, Productivity is measured workforce-wide. And if you've got a college education or better, productivity, uh, your productivity is probably being enhanced by technology and technology-enabled disruption. You might go through some traumas in your career, have to change jobs, have to learn, but you've got the skills to do it. And because of that, if you've got a college education in this country, the statistics are uh, you're likely uh, you're likely that your unemployment rate on average is, is a little less than two percent. The headline rate is three and a half. You've got a much more a li higher likelihood of being employed, and your participation rate, the odds that you're in the workforce, are dramatically higher than the average. If, on the other hand, you've got a high school education or less, which is 46 million workers out of 160 million workers in this country. Uh, you're likely seeing, because of technology, your job either restructured or eliminated. Your participation rate is much lower than the average, and your unemployment rate is much higher than the average. And so at the Dallas Fed, we do a lot of work to talk about the fact we need to, we've done a good job in Texas beefing up skills training. We think we have to do dramatically a better job. Uh, the jobs of the future are going to require better literacy, better educational attainment, but more often than not, they're going to require more skills training. And so we've got to adapt to that. And this is why we're also been glad and spent a lot of time in Austin and with leaders through the state working on policies and encouraging policies that improve early childhood literacy and improve our math, science, and reading. We rank, uh, by our estimate, about 20th out of 36 industrialized nations in math, science, and reading. And all the research we see suggests that if we could just improve that, we would improve our productivity. So those are two big issues as to why uh, GDP growth uh, is, is sluggish. And we think potential GDP growth, if we don't address those two issues, is likely to continue to trail down where when we're talking with you five or 10 years from now, it's more likely we're going to be talking about growth rates one and a half to two percent as opposed to two to two and a half percent. Now, we can do something about these issues. And the reason there's an imperative is we're a very highly leveraged country. You know, debt held by the public is about 78 percent of GDP. And now the present value of unfunded entitlements is $59 trillion, which is a nice way of saying every day we grow at 2%, we just increase the burden on our children and grandchildren because we're not growing fast enough to deleverage. We're getting more leveraged. OK, so let me comment on two other uh, points. The energy business. So um, energy business is a good example of an industry that is heavily affected by global growth. And so, because it affects the price of the commodity. 
And so we, we expect this during this coming year, the price of oil to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to $60 a barrel, depending on whether you're looking at Brent or WTI. Uh, obviously, there's a 3 or $4 or $5 gap. But, but what's happening uh, in the energy sector uh, is shale has turned out to be more challenging, more of a scale business than many people had thought. Uh, and secondly, uh, there's been a much greater push by capital providers in the energy business uh, for capital discipline, quote unquote, which means you got to make better returns. Uh, in, in the past, there was a premium on volume, drilling more. Today, there's a premium on make a return on capital. Lower price of oil, slower global growth makes that more challenging. And so what most businesses we talk to in this industry are telling us, we're under pressure to fund our CapEx out of cash flow, as opposed to borrow to fund CapEx. And so as a result of that, it's our best judgment that energy CapEx this year in the United States is going to be down 10 to 15 percent. So that's a big decline. And we expect production growth, net production growth in the United States, which was about 2 million barrels a day uh, in 2018. It slipped to about 900,000 barrels a day net growth in 2019. We think it'll be less than 500,000 barrels a day net growth. Uh, in 2020. In that regard, the coronavirus is yet another uh, wild card that just limits China consumption, obviously, and global demand is another challenge for the industry. Um, now, uh, how does all this affect the state of Texas? The good news is uh, about Texas now is so diversified over the last 20, 30 years that energy is about 9% of GDP. We still expect solid growth in the state of Texas, and we expect for the foreseeable future, Texas is likely to outperform the nation. Why? Because we've got population growth. We've got workforce growth, and heavily because of migration of people and firms to the state. Population of the state was 22 million in a fraction 10 years ago. It's on its way to 29 million today, and we think over the next 20 years, this, the population of the state could get up to 40 million people. This is a stark contrast to most other states in the country whose populations are flat to down. We are growing, which tells me we're going to have uh, plenty of a tailwind to grow GDP, fund our priorities, improve education, build our infrastructure, and, and make this a very attractive place uh, for the University of Texas and for all of us to work and to live. So thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Rob. I, I was thinking about that. Uh, we tell this story about the thriving Texas and the growth in Texas. And this week or so is, is admission season. And I start to think about when the, when the state is at 40 million people, how hard it will be to get into our university. Um, and that dean will get yelled at a lot. Um, so, but it's gonna be, it's gonna be great. Um, so it's now my, my privilege to bring up one of our faculty members. And uh, many of you have, have probably heard us talk about one of the big challenges we have is continuing to recruit, attract, and retain the very best faculty to the Macomb School. And uh, we trotted out one of those very best today. Uh, professor James Scott is a professor of statistics and data science at the Macomb School, the University of Texas at Austin. He has devoted his career to questions about how to improve the world using data science and how to communicate that potential to as wide an audience as possible. He's the author of the recent book, AIQ, How People and Machines Are Sparter Together which critics have praised as, quote, a model of how to make data science accessible and exciting, as a, quote, passionate book, and as a book about artificial intelligence with a, quote, moral core. As a researcher, he collaborates across a wide range of fields and has received a number of research awards, including the prestigious NSF Career Award, the National Science Foundation's top distinction for career research achievements. Much of his recent research has focused on applications of AI and data science in maternal and child health. He has studied the impact of the Zika virus on pregnant women in Latin America, the burden of asthma in Texas school children, and why you shouldn't have your baby in the ninth hour of your doctor's 12-hour shift. <laughs> He's also won many teaching awards for his work in the classroom, including the Regents Outstanding Teaching Award, the highest teaching honor in the University of Texas system. So with that, please join Professor Scott. Well, thank you. Thank you, Jay, and, and thanks everyone for being here. Uh, it's, uh, 
it's fun to actually be back out uh, talking to folks again. I've uh, was chatting with Jay a little bit. I've been kind of on the shelf for six months uh, with a new baby at home, and so uh, if I'm a little rusty up here, I haven't been in the classroom for a while. So so cut me a little slack. Uh, I'm going to talk today uh, about artificial intelligence, and and you are probably aware of of the sheer volume of breathless panting about this subject on blog posts and kind of conversations in the business community. And, and so my simple goal today is just to bring a little bit of clarity to this subject uh, and answer some, some basic terminological questions like what is AI, what is machine learning, uh, and think a little bit about how those uh, new technologies might play out a little bit in, in real estate. Uh, so uh, what is AI? Uh, it's a hard term to define. Um, how is it different from something like machine learning, another term you may have heard of? Uh, my definition of AI would be it's an entire engineering system that you build uh, with machine learning at its core, but only one part of it, right? There's a lot of domain structure in artificial intelligence, whether that's the rules of chess or the economic demands of what a search engine has to do. Uh, and then there's also the upstream data collection aspect of that, what data goes into the machine learning algorithms and how that data is collected. Uh, if you'd like an analogy, here would be mine. Uh, this is like machine learning, and this is like artificial intelligence. So this is an electric motor. Uh, it's a commodity. It's a general purpose technology. You take this electric motor, you drop it into a car, and it can get you in trouble with the traffic cops. Uh, you drop it into an electric pump, and it can empty the bilge tank of a boat. You drop it into a Roomba, and it can vacuum the cat litter from your floors. Uh, it's only when you put an entire engineering system around this electric motor that you actually get something uh, that does something useful. And that's kind of like the distinction between machine learning and artificial intelligence. All artificial intelligence systems have at their core some kind of motor, that's machine learning. Uh, where this analogy breaks down a little bit, and we'll, where we'll, we'll talk about this later, is, is the data aspect of things. Uh, an electric motor runs on electricity, and electricity is a commodity. Literally, all electrons are the same. Uh, machine learning algorithms run on data. Data is not a commodity, and not all data points are the same. We may try to return to that point at the end. So I'll give you an example to try to make this uh, you know, a little bit more specific in your minds. I'll, I'll talk about a, a very successful application of machine learning uh, that was described in a, a research paper published by Google scientists back in 2014 on image recognition. Uh, so what you're looking at here is a small sample of literally tens of millions of images collected from the World Wide Web by researchers at Stanford uh, and laboriously annotated by a team of human annotators. And these images don't think, oh, some are dogs and some are cats. We're talking highly specific categories, hundreds of different dog breeds like huskies and Shih Tzus and stuff like that, not just boats or vessels, but something as specific as a trimaran. And the goal of building the machine learning algorithm here is to take in the image, the raw pixels, and form a prediction about what that image actually has in it. This is a core machine learning task, and it's been super successful over the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, to give you an example of how Google's algorithm performs, I challenge you to annotate those images. They're, they're kind of northern dogs, right? One's a Siberian Husky, one's an Eskimo dog. I personally feel like I'd have to be a dog breeder to tell the difference. Uh, Google's image recognition tells the difference with very, very high fidelity. That gives you a level, an idea of the level of specificity uh, of image recognition that machines are capable of. Uh, this is a fun one, right? You can give even fairly abstract images to these algorithms. I'll put Jay on the spot for this one. Jay, what do you see up here? Uh, some sort of animal face on the left, textile in the middle. Okay. No idea the right. Okay, moth. Uh, moth. Actually, you and the you and the machine agree on the right. These are the annotations <laughs> provided by Google's image recognition algorithm. And again, it never saw these images before. It's just its best guess. So you can see that it is genuinely getting at something important and useful about distinguishing uh, what types of things are in each image. Okay. So how does this work under the hood? Uh, that's a very natural question when people see that machines are capable of this kind of performance. How is it doing the magic? And the short answer is uh, with an equation, okay? And it's, uh, it's just the, uh, in, in structure, the same kind of equation that you might have seen in, in high school. Uh, it's an equation that has inputs, the data on the right, and a prediction on the left. I'll give you an example of, of kind of what these equations might look like in principle. Uh, these are equations that you might have, you know, might have seen before or might dream up. 
Uh, the top one is one you'll read a lot on exercise websites. If you want to predict your maximum heart rate, subtract your age from 220. Here, age is an input. Maximum heart rate is the prediction. And this uh, allows you to make a guess about what your maximum heart rate would be without actually sticking you on a treadmill and making you run so fast until you vomit. Uh, here might be kind of a kindergarten level predictive model for a price of a house in Austin. You take the square footage, multiply it by 400, you add to that 30,000 times the number of swimming pools that house has, and you come up with a prediction for the price. Uh, the point is the numbers in these equations, the 220, the 400, the 30,000, those numbers aren't governed by any kind of like scientific theory or anything deep. They're just chosen to describe the data as accurately as possible. And the types of equations that are used in Google's image recognition algorithm are exactly the same in character. Um, they're just much, much bigger equations that we really struggle to write out. We instead draw these funky little diagrams that represent different kinds of mathematical operations. Uh, it's nonetheless interesting to ask the question, just how big is this equation? So this is an equation for uh, maybe predicting the price of a house uh, near the campus area in Austin that you could fit on a post-it note, right? So if I say that this equation is kind of one post-it note's worth of, of writing, uh, the obvious question is, how big is Google's equation that predicts you, you input the raw Im uh, pixels in an image and it spits out a prediction of what the probability, you know, 10%, 90%, that this image contains a Siberian Husky. Uh, I actually went to the original research paper and did a little back of the envelope calculation and, and came up with the figure 194,368 post-it notes it would take to actually write that equation down. It's just an equation though, a really big, a really complicated one. I'll also make the point that Google obviously isn't the only company trying to do this well. Microsoft came out a couple of years later with a competing model, a different equation. They call it ResNet for reasons not worth going into. Um, it certainly wouldn't fit on a, on a post-it note either. In fact, it would take 11.5 million post-it notes to write that equation out. For those of you not used to thinking in units of mega post-its, uh, I did a little conversion here. That's uh, 24 acres of post-it notes. Uh, roughly enough post-its to paper over every football stadium in the Big 12 playing field and stands. So it's a, and that's one equation, okay, to give you a sense of just how complicated these models are. They are complicated, but it, I guess the other thing to emphasize, it's a difference in scale, but not a difference in kind. It's just an equation, inputs in the right, predictions in the left. So that's machine learning, right? It's uh, something that's capable of taking an image and forming a prediction about what we're seeing in that image. The best image recognition algorithms these days achieve superhuman performance. If you ask uh, people off the street to annotate what they see in these images, they're accurate uh, to a level of about 95%. The best machine learning algorithms get 97, 98% these days, and that number is only climbing. Uh, I, would have law I would have not gotten the Siberian Husky Eskimo dog ones right for example. So now the question is, how might you use this kind of machine learning algorithm in a larger AI system that might do something useful in real estate? And I'll try to kind of walk through an example of something that I know that there are a lot of companies out there working on, and, and it would be in property management here. So uh, let's say that you hire a, a drone company uh, to fly a, a drone route over, say, a distribution center that you own. This is something that you might imagine a company like Prologis doing. Uh, you know, they own, I don't know, probably a billion square feet of uh, supply chain centers, distribution centers. Their business is renting that out to companies who need that as part of their supply chains. Uh, and so they're naturally interested in maintaining those properties, making sure the pavement is good. Pavement's a big deal if there's a lot of trucks going to and fro. So you hire a drone company to, uh, to fly and take a bunch of pictures of your facility. Uh, and then you get a bunch of little individual photos that you stitch together in what's called an orthomosaic. Think like Google Maps satellite view here. Uh, and maybe you zoom in on this particular picture of one of your parking lots, one of your pavements. Uh, and now you're interested in like, do we need to send some pavement people out here to fix this? Uh, this is the kind of thing that in a, in a past era, you might have sent engineers out to walk the site and ascertain the condition of the pavement. These days, you're probably having those engineers sit in a room and look at photos from one of these drone uh, flying operations, uh, but you could easily imagine deploying the kind of technology that Google has to identify whether there are Siberian Huskies in image to return a prediction about what we're seeing in that picture of pavement. You might, uh, you might train it to produce a prediction of something called the pavement condition index, a uh, big deal if you're a pavement person. Uh, you might ask it to classify whether there's something called alligator cracking in that picture of pavement. You might ask the algorithm to count 
the number of potholes. And if you have millions of images like this of uh, pavement and have had engineers annotate those images as what's in them, not huskies, but alligator cracking or, or whatever it is, uh, it's very feasible to imagine training machine learning algorithms to produce these predictions yourself. Uh, and now think about how that fits into some kind of larger AI system where uh, there are machine learning algorithms that are, that are saying, here's where we need more data, so here should be your drone routes to go fly, kind of like an experimental design aspect of, of things. Uh, and there are other machine learning algorithms that are saying, hey, we know uh, what the condition of our pavement at all of our uh, you know, 3,000 distribution centers is. Uh, now, what predictive, uh, predict like what that's going to look like five, ten years from now and come up with some kind of optimal maintenance schedule uh, of, of what uh, we should be spending to make our pavements uh, better. Okay, so that's, that's kind of how the machine learning thing would be a little module in a larger AI system that might be of use in, uh, to, you know, my, my kind of archetype here would be like a prologis. Okay. Uh, and I can imagine lots and lots of other applications. Uh, you know, I was talking about maintenance scheduling. I'll give you one other kind of easy example that I know, again, there's a lot of startups uh, trying to do and, and a lot of big companies as well, you know, Zillow's and Redfin's of the world. Uh, and that's particularly on valuation. This will be an example of residential valuation. Uh, I'll just show you two pictures of, a, of two houses that are both for sale right now in the campus area around the University of Texas. Here's one, uh, one of the pictures uh, on Zillow. That has, it's a house that has three bedrooms, three bathrooms, uh, 1,750 square feet, pretty close to campus. Here's another house, three bedrooms, three bathrooms, 1,825 square feet, both for sale in Austin. I'll show you these again, house one, house two. I think we can all agree these houses are different from each other, and it's not just the 75 square feet. Very plausible that you could imagine training a machine learning algorithm to recognize and make automated pricing or uh, you know, market-based valuations for houses on the basis of what it's seeing in these images. Okay. Uh, you could do the same for, say, text descriptions and use machine learning algorithms geared towards natural language processing. And this is kind of, on some level, this is an easy win that the Zillows and Redfins and the long tail of startups uh, after them are trying to do right now, I know for a fact. OK. Uh, I, now, the natural, those are two examples, right? And I, I was just focusing on image recognition and image processing as one uh, very, very uh, successful application of machine learning technology in other areas. Uh, I think there's a broader question here about if you think about a data set that you might be sitting on or a problem you might be sitting on and are pondering the question of will AI work for that problem, I'd like to kind of equip you with two criteria that I think are useful to apply to that situation. Will AI work for a problem? And the two criteria, it's all about data at the end of the day. First of all, what you've measured in that data set has to be very high quality. Uh, we have to measure what we care about, not just very weak proxies for what we care about. That's crucial. And number two, you just have to have a mountain of it. Lots and lots and lots of very detailed data. If you think of a data set as a spreadsheet, where every row is a property or a person or a unit of observation, and every column is some fact or detail or feature that you know about that person or property, your spreadsheet has to be both very long, lots of rows, and very wide, lots of columns. Big N, big D, right? Lots of samples, lots of detail. And I'll just tell two quick stories, whatever I have time for here, uh, about some, some examples in my career uh, that have kind of brought home to me the fact that while these ideas are very widely appreciated among machine learning and data science researchers, they are almost universally not appreciated outside that narrow community. Uh, first is a story about basketball. Uh, so at one point a few years ago, I was approached by a professional basketball team saying, hey, you know, James, we would like to improve our player evaluation models using modern data science and artificial intelligence. Sounds great. Uh, so we had a conversation about what their data looked like, and there were a lot of terabytes mentioned in this conversation. Oh, we've got terabytes of data from video interviews. We've got terabytes of data from uh, motion capture, from cameras hanging in the rafters of NBA development league arenas and college arenas. Uh, it's more data than you could possibly ever hope to store on a laptop. And I thought, well, this is potentially very promising. And then we ran aground over two key facts. First of all, we didn't actually have very qu high quality measurements about the ultimate goal, which was how good a basketball player these people were. We had only a very weak proxy, which was where they were drafted in the NBA draft or whether they were drafted. And that's not a very strong predictor of someone's ultimate NBA career performance. The second problem was that they had these terabytes of data, motion capture, video, interviews, 
on only 240 basketball players. And that is not nearly enough uh, to make use of the kinds of technology that Google has made commonplace for image recognition and machine learning. There's a reason that you need so much data to make these algorithms work, and it's very simple. Humans are smart and machines are dumb, and the only way that machines ever compete with humans is by having orders of magnitude more experience than we do. That is millions and tens of millions and billions of data points. If you don't have that, the machine learning algorithms will never achieve the scale uh, that they need in order to get quality performance. A second example is one I'm going to experience here in a few hours on my way back to Austin, uh, one of these full body scanners that many of us have had the privilege of going through at TSA checkpoints. Uh, I, I encountered a story uh, maybe two, three years ago in the New York Times uh, saying, Uncle Sam wants your deep neural networks. Uh, for those not familiar with the terminology, a deep neural network is just one of these giant fancy equations that fits on 24 acres of post-it notes that I was referring to earlier. Uh, and the story was about how uh, the Transportation Security Administration was interested in using these kinds of image recognition algorithms uh, to either supplement or potentially replace humans at security checkpoints. And, and this is, I actually got really interested in this. I thought this was a great idea. Uh, for one thing, it's a problem that machines are really good at, about classifying an image from a full body scan, yes or no, is this person carrying something dangerous like a gun or a knife or an iPhone through security, or are they not, right? And second, there is scale here, right? There's millions and millions of body scans every month. Uh, and so I thought this is actually an excellent application of machine learning technology. And where I started pulling my hair out was when I reached the 12th paragraph of this article uh, in which the journalist pointed out that to help data scientists and machine learning researchers train their algorithms, Homeland Security is supplying more than 1,000 three-dimensional body scans and making those public. Uh, and why I tore my hair out is because you need about three more zeros there in order to make this actually work. And it was uh, both aggravating and very instructive to me that nobody seemed to appreciate that, whether the Homeland Security people, the data scientists that were selling them some snake oil, or we can do this with a thousand scans, or the journalist who's reporting on the article. Okay, so uh, those are two vignettes uh, that I think for me drive home the point that you need quality measurement and you need vast scale in your data sets if you ever want to make the machine learning algorithms at the core of an AI system ever work. And of course, that doesn't uh, even begin to touch the problem of how you build out the engineering system around it. It's one thing to have a voice recognition algorithm. Uh, that's machine learning. It's an entirely different thing to build something called an Amazon Echo, which is a piece of hardware and an interconnected network of those algorithms that actually does something useful. It's roughly the difference between having an electric motor and having a Tesla. So with that, I'll kind of rewind to my uh, maybe conjectures about where uh, we might see some changes in the real estate market uh, on the basis of AI. I'd be very interested in hearing from the panel on this one and hearing from you. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll leave you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, James. A, uh, a rusty James is still better than most of us. Uh, so, so thanks a lot for doing that. Um, so now we're going to have a, a panel. We're trying a little bit different format this year. So instead of having um, our other two industry experts up and, and talking, uh, we thought we would try it in a more of a panel format. But get, please get your questions ready. So I'm going to have a, have a few things I'm going to ask first, and then we'll get it open up to the rest of the room. Um, so I'm going to introduce our panelists, and then we'll bring them all up and, and have them join uh, Robert and James on the panel. Uh, so first, we have Mary Hager. Mary is the co-founder and co-CEO of Factory Partners, a diversified private equity real estate company based here in Dallas. She has 30 years of experience in the real estate industry. She was responsible for setting firm strategy, sourcing and financing real estate transactions, marketing investment partnerships to institutional investors, and supervising the overall operations of the portfolio in the company. Factory invests nationally in industrial and rental housing investments through a series of private equity funds. Since inception, Thackeray has closed on transactions totally nearing $5 billion in asset value. Investment activity includes over 230 separate transactions representing 22,500 rental units and 19.5 million square feet of industrial space. Her investor relationships include university and hospital endowments, charitable foundations, corporate pension funds, and high net worth family offices. Prior to Thackeray, she spent over 16 years in various roles at Trammell Crow Company and subsequently Crow Holdings. She is currently serving as chair of the advisory council for the Real Estate Center, the University of Texas, thank you, where she's also a member of the executive council. She's an active member of the Urban Land Institute, currently serving as America's global governing trustee 
on the Investment Committee for the ULI Foundation, as Vice Chair of the North Texas District Council and on the National Product Council. She received her BBA from the McComb School of Business at the University of Texas at Austin. Thanks for doing this, Mary. Our second uh, panelist from the real estate side is Mike Lafitte. Mike is the Global Chief Executive Officer of CBRE's advisory services businesses, business, which includes advisory and transaction services, asset services, capital markets, local product, project management, and valuations. Prior to his current role, he was Global Group President, Chief Operating Officer from 2012 to 2016, and before that served as President Americas. He joined Tremel Crow Company in 1997 and served in various roles, including Chief Operating Officer of Global Services, Regional Director of the Central Region of the U.S., and Dallas Market Leader. CBRE acquired Trammell Crow Company in 2006. He has been in the commercial real estate business since 1984, when he joined Lincoln Property Company in Dallas, and has also served in production, leadership, and development roles with Bear Stearns and Premises Real Estate Services, an affiliate, affiliate of Prudential Life Insurance Company. He also received his BBA degree from the McComb School of Business at the University of Texas at Austin. So thanks, Mike. I will say I have not had one where we had a panelist come in, and I heard somebody say they went, I think, to high school or kindergarten with Mike, and somebody else say that, that Mike was their lawn guy. Um, so, so uh, you know, all lawn guys could turn into to Mike Lafitte. That'd be, that'd be a great training ground. Um, so with that, please join me in welcoming the panel up here to the stage. So thank you all, and uh, Mary, no pressure. We thought you'd let you, we'd let you kick it off. Um, so you, you know, specialize in rental, multifamily, industrial. Just a little bit before we get into the AI stuff, tell me what's going on in your markets. What are you seeing? Um, how are times now? What fundamentals as well as capital flows? So talk about something I'm comfortable with. Yeah, that's right. Um, so, so first of all, thank you for having me here, and thank you for having it at the Fed. Um, I, to start with, I mean, if you think about uh, apartments and warehouses, I'll make sort of a macro comment, and that is we're seeing fundamentals that we think are really strong right now, and everything feels pretty good. And, you know, if you just start with apartments, there's a lot of reasons that demand is so strong. Um, it includes the fact that there's a lot more student debt now. There's a lot of people that don't have savings. Uh, people are starting, you know, they're getting married later. They're starting families later. Um, but it's not just youngsters that are driving the demand. I mean, we're seeing a higher propensity to rent across every age cohort. So, you know, demand is really good in apartments right now. If you look at supply, I would say generally supply is also kind of in check, but there's sort of pockets of exception. Um, I think that 80 to 85% of the supply this time around has really just targeted the affluent renter. So I think that's more like 20% of the, the population. Um, and I think you could see some softness as a result in some pockets. Um, as a firm, we've always focused on apartments that offer obtainable rents. In other words, we're trying to appeal to a broadest swath of the population. Um, and as a result, we're not working in the luxury or the, the high rise side. Um, with that as a backdrop, we saw great rent growth last year. I mean, at the top line, we were at about 6% growth in our revenues. And our occupancies are 94, 95%, so apartments feel pretty good. Switching to industrial briefly, um, I think we can all relate to why demand is so strong in industrial. And that's that e-commerce has been such a game changer. Um, and the quickest way to kind of explain why it's such a game changer is it takes three times the warehouse space to execute a e-commerce business than it does to a traditional retail. So it used to be in traditional retail, you'd pull a large pallet off the racks, you'd ship it to a retailer, and then they would break it down and sell the goods. And now in an e-commerce operation, you're picking each individual parcel off the rack and shipping to each individual customer you know, that wants their package uh, quickly. And that's the other thing that we're seeing happening is delivery time expectations are shrinking. So all the tenants want to be closer and closer in to population bases, and that's driving a lot of demand in uh, infill locations. These buildings are usually smaller. They are sometimes older buildings. If you get a newer building, you sometimes have you know, quite a bit of expense to build it. And there hasn't been that much supply in these smaller buildings. 
So what we're seeing is a huge rent growth in the smaller industrial buildings, about twice what you're seeing in normal industrial. Um, so demand and supply are somewhat in check in industrial, and it's been you know, really healthy. As a firm, we've always invested in what we used to call shallow bay multi-tenant warehouses. They would be you know, 100 to 200,000 square feet. They're usually going to be infill. And now they have the new moniker of um, last mile warehouse, and they're all the rage, and they're performing quite well. Um, the challenge for us, as you step back from the fundamentals being strong, is that pricing is just really aggressive right now. Um, and that's obvious because there's so much capital in the market chasing uh, transactions. They're looking for yield. Industrial and apartments, I would tell you, have a pretty predictable cash flow stream. So you know they provide a good yield. And it, so it makes it very competitive for us. So fundamentals are good for what we own. Selling is great if we're trying to sell. But we're trying to buy new deals. It's been a bit of a challenge. So if I summarize, you're happy that there's more student debt. <clears throat> And you're and you're and you're complaining that prices are high. Yeah, exactly. That's, <laughs> Somewhat. Somewhat, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Mike, what do you see from CBR? Obviously, a huge breadth yeah. of, of seeing things. Yeah, we have. What do you see have, across your portfolio? Yeah, we have a great you know global view uh, because we are uh, truly. I mean, we're the biggest uh, real estate firm in the world, and uh, I'd say a couple of things. Number one, it is real estate. Commercial real estate is a massive asset class, um, and it's growing. So you look at the component parts of it, like Mary was, was saying, the fundamentals, mostly all around the world, there are, there are pockets. But certainly in the US, the fundamentals are really strong. I mean, so the vacancy rates have been coming down in every asset class you know, for the last five, six years. So this run that we've been on, all fueled by the GDP, all fueled by jobs, all fueled by you know, e-commerce, every sector is improving and really, really strong. We'll talk, we can talk about Dallas later and kind of where we sit. Allocations to. Uh, to real estate are going up. If you look 20, 15, 20 years ago, the institutions would say four to five percent of our um, investable assets will be aimed at real estate. Today, that number is eight to ten percent. So it's almost doubled. And real estate, in, in a portfolio theory, has done its job. It's, it has performed extremely well. And, and, uh, and the, the discipline, uh, I would say, in terms of just the, the financing markets, has been very strong and kept that, that supply and demand in check. You know, where you, we're not like the 80s when I started here in Dallas, we tripled the office space in this city from 1979 to 1985, and it was just out of control, hmm. all for the wrong reasons, tax, you know, tax motivations. But the supply demand today is really in check, and so there is a uh, ample equity and debt for the industry, and it's really, really in good shape. We can talk a little bit also about some of the how technology is starting to, not I wouldn't say disrupt, but impact. Yeah. Impact. What so among that, uh, out of that breadth, where do you see the most excitement? Whether it's a different asset class or geography, or so, where is the most fervor um, in terms of the capital or, or excitement in, in terms of investment? I, I clearly, industrial and multifamily uh, in the U.S. Number one and two. You can debate which is one and which is two, but that's where the appetite is. Tons of smart money. Blackstone is all in. You know, they they pretty much declared almost everything they're doing right now is is industrial, and it's hard to aggregate big portfolios of industrial. So, if you're a firm like Blackstone, you've got the kind of uh, dry powder that they have, you know, they're raising five to 10 billion a year in their B rate, this high net worth channel of, of money coming in. So those two asset classes for sure. Uh, but you look up and down the, the, the spectrum of risk of where people play, you've got core assets, core plus, all the way up to opportunistic and value add, and it's almost like colleges. There's a, there's a place for everyone on the curve. So it's, it's, it's a matter of what's the capital looking for. You've got foreign capital, by the way, cross-border uh, investment was down about 20% last year. You know, some countries were just kind of risk off. You know, the Asian markets pulled back. But still, very healthy capital flows going around the world. Um, lots of interest in core, very, very competitive pricing. I mean, you're seeing in some markets around the world, you know, 2 3% cap rates. In the U.S., multifamily cap rates, 4 to 5% is not unusual to see at all. So incredibly um, high prices, great time to be a seller. But also, you look at the spread between, you know, your alternatives, and it's still... It's still a nice return. And so what about Texas? You mentioned Dallas, and you know, Rob talked about what's going on in our region. So how are you all seeing Texas fitting in this broader perspective, and Dallas in particular? You know, I would say that um, job growth markets are where we've been focused since the downturn. And Texas, the Texas story is just, you know, it's a home run. Um, we've spent a lot of time investing in Texas. We've done well here. And, and it's, been, it's really been fun to watch. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Dallas, on the office side, it's, it, it's all about job growth. We, we, uh, in 2019, Dallas was the number one city uh, in the U.S. in job growth. Over 50,000 jobs uh, in Dallas last year driving the office sector here, and that's just been a consistent theme. This, this is a place where corporate headquarters, you're seeing more and more of them coming. Uh, McKesson, you just start listing the companies, the headquarters that are here. So Dallas is faring quite well. Our airport, you look at all the things that are going on here. But Dallas on the office market is a kind of a, still a haves and a have nots. We've got high vacancy rates, the published rates, 26% vacancy in the, in the CBD. Suburbs still say 20%, but you go out here to, to pockets in uptown, it's full. And, and you know, so the great high quality buildings are doing quite well. Same thing on, on uh, industrial. Industrial uh, absorption here was number one uh, in, the, in the US last year, 23 million square feet absorbed in this market last year. Uh, number two was Inland Empire, which has been a, which is a massive industrial market in California. Hmm. They did about 19 and a half million square feet. So Texas is faring very well and Dallas is, is leading the pack. So let's talk a little about data. So part of why we thought we liked the, the juxtaposition here is we've got, you know, Mary, your firm at Thackeray and of, you know, doing what you do uh, very, very well. And you've got Mike doing things, you know, doing all things uh, for, for lots of different kinds of perspectives. So talk a little about data and uh, whether it's data, you know, more cutting edge techniques or, or basics. So Mary, how, how is data in your business and how have things been changing over time? Well, it's, it's hugely important. It's always been hugely important, but it's been fun to see over, you know, a 30 year career how the access to data and the availability of data has just continued to improve and get better and better and better. You know, we're a small investor in real estate assets, so we're not going to be the ones that have a, a, the availability of the kind of data you're talking about to develop it. So we're always partnering with groups like CB on, you know, industrial or, you know, a gray star for apartments. And so those that have access to quite a bit of information is always very helpful for us. I, you know, I thought I'd sort of touch on as we think about what, what, we're talking about with AI here and machine learning. You know, when you look at the space that we're in, where it's smaller buildings and multi-tenant, the average tenant is probably 35 to 40,000 feet. I actually talked to some of my f friends that I'm, we're developing with, and we're not seeing any kind of automation or robotics yet in those smaller spaces. At some point, I think you obviously will start to see it as it becomes more cost effective, but right now we're not seeing as much of it in what we're doing. And Mike, what about CB? What do you? What yeah, are you all doing? a couple of comments. First of all, the the whole prop tech investment around uh, real estate has been accelerating at a, an amazing rate. Twenty fifteen, there was like five billion dollars in prop tech venture capital into our industry. Uh, in the la last year, that that number was up to twenty billion dollars. These are companies trying to go find some disruption or something to build a niche. You know, for years we had companies like CoStar that you know they trade on completely different valuations. They trade like a, a technology company, multiples of. 90 times earnings versus a real estate company, public company that'll trade on 15 as an average. So, there, and we've invested in some of those prop tech funds, a fifth wall and some of the others. So there's a lot of experimenting going on, a few unicorns that are coming out of, that are successful companies that get early adoption, companies like BTS and Hightower, they merged, uh, that are doing things with data and, and listings, great, a great uh, platform for landlords, Blackstone invested with them. Um, what are we doing? Probably six or seven years ago, we hired a consulting firm, kind of looked at our own spend as a big Fortune 150 company and said, you know, we've got to figure out, you know, we know that if we want to win, we got to, we've got to do more here. They would tell you that any kind of world-class company would spend plus or minus 5% of their revenue on, on technology, and we're now at that level. Um, hundreds of millions of dollars of CapEx and OpEx, and Dallas is kind of the center of that. We have 900 jobs in our digital and technology uh, group here in Dallas, uh, downtown and in Richardson, which has you know, doubled in the last three years. So we're bringing lots of technology jobs. We're hiring data scientists like we've never done. So taking that data, we have a huge project called Inter Enterprise Data Platform where we're taking all of our data, putting it all in one big uh, platform. We've been doing that for the last two years so that we can then start to act on it and weaponize that and kind of use that in ways for analytics. As a couple of examples, uh, in addition to what James has said, where we see it's certainly valuations is a, is a very logical place where you think about you know, the process of doing evaluation, it's all manual. All that information, you, you could make it, you can automate that, and we're starting to do that. We can do any, we're doing evaluations in Spain in 15 seconds now. It's not a full MAI appraisal, but it's pretty close. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of that going on. Think about drive times. We have technicians driving around all the time. Also with GPS and trackers on there, you can really reduce drive times, reduce efficiency, drive up operations. You've got smart building uh, technology that is really changing the way buildings operate, making them more efficient. Sensors, uh, occupancy management, all those kinds of things 
uh, going on. So there's a lot of things that are potentially, that's not so disruptive to our industry. We don't see transactions happening online. We just don't. It's too complex of an asset class for you to you know, buy a building with a click. That's not going to happen. But we think the winners and losers will be investing in a, in a big way in, in technology, and we're certainly spending. And you, there will be, you'll lose money along the way. Uh, it, they're not going to all uh, win, but it's, it's, uh, it's exciting to be a part of it. So I, I thought before we open it up, we'd, we'd go just sort of down the panel and talk about what's one thing you've seen lately that you've thought, wow, that's interesting from a, from a data or technology perspective. And so something that sort of caught your attention um, that, that, that you know about is, is sort of an advance. I'll, I'll start with James uh, so that I could give Rob time to think. Uh, so. Sure. Well, I think you saw, I mean, my, honestly, my favorite one was the one I highlighted is the, the pavements example because it's so deeply unsexy and yet a really incredible application of machine learning technology. And, and uh, you know, I just, you, you kind of, you imagine the dominoes falling for doing that kind of thing where, you know, you have a company. And as far as I know, there's no company that has stitched this together end to end in terms of having the drone operations plus the, the machine learning infrastructure and the data infrastructure plus the actual pavement guys, right? But you can imagine a company that, can puts, that, that puts that together in, say, that vertical. Uh, you know, and you could imagine the same kind of underlying idea and technology for stuff like pipelines or municipal infrastructure. And, and that, that becomes, I mean, I, you know, who knows? But that, that seems to me like it could be a billion dollar company. I'll say the other one that, that uh, you know, something that Mike mentioned to me that I, has just been my experience universally every time I talk to somebody, whether it's a researcher, somebody in, in the corporate world, is the sheer effort involved in getting a data resource together. I mean, you mentioned a lot of, a lot of money and a lot of time in putting the, the data resource together before you can even hit go on any, doing anything remotely interesting with that data. And I, I think it speaks to the underlying point that the, the kind of Anytime you're talking about AI or machine learning, really the, the rents go to the data. Uh, it's not the algorithms that provide the different mm. source of differentiation. It's the data resources that people put together. Mike? Uh, you know, for me, I think in, within our company, the thing that, that I think is all the predictive uh, analytics is very promising in terms of what that can mean for operating uh, real estate. The analytics, I'll just take our capital markets, our investment sales business as an example. We have a couple of platforms. One's a, a platform that kind of manages the day-to-day -day bids and all the, the activity of putting a property on the market, getting the bids, all the war rooms, and all the information that comes back from that. And the other is a CRM system with all of our own notes. Our ability now to kind of predict who's the going to be the profile of the buyer with thousands of bids, saying, okay, well, this buyer was you know, within 2% of the last five deals. And all of a sudden, we can do some analytics and kind of almost predict and tell an owner that wants to take a, a building to market, well, here's the profile, here's the analytics, now we can put some magic to that, and maybe some people in other parts of the country that have been hitting, you know, they've been missing. They've been number two or number three for three or four deals in a row, but this deal over here has got a profile that fits their, their needs, and the, that broker running the deal over here might not have known about it. So all of a sudden, I think you can become, you can use that as a tool, ultimately, to get better outcomes. Yeah, it's sort of a, a real estate's large as a search market. Correct. And you can do better searching and better right. matching. Right. Yeah. Mary? You know, um, we have a more limited view. We have a very simple business, quite frankly, so we're not necessarily experiencing this other than working with groups like Mike's that, that kind of tell us what the new tools are and that we can buy from them. So that's, that's kind of interesting to us. I mean, the business is somewhat simple. I think at some point it'll be nice to have more, you know, to, to have more automatic modeling, some things that could happen that we don't have right now and aren't as cost effective or um, we're not sure they work yet. So. It's a more limited view. Rob, was real estate or otherwise, anything to strike you? Recently? Yeah, so I mean, from my point of view, what I'm looking at is how is this affecting pricing power of businesses and the need for scale. And um, two things that, that have struck me is one, businesses you would never think of as, as uh, technology businesses have had to become. So what's an example? The Dairy Queen that you go to. If you don't have pre-order technology now at Dairy Queen, you're, you're, you've got a real problem. And so the Dairy Queen operators, for example, in the state, we've got one of them on our board, Robert Lozano, they've had to make a big investment, but this is happening across businesses. And then the second thing, which is a little disturbing, is uh, I think Professor Scott said the, the rents go to the data, right? And we're seeing that in that if you're a big platform company and you have access to a massive amount of data, that's allowing these companies to bundle products and services, 
make little or no gross margin on some products so they can make a lot of gross margin on others, and you need data to do that. So the other thing that what I'm getting to is scale has never been more important, and we're hearing all sorts of stories. These big companies that have this access to data and growing are uh, making it very hard for uh, competitors who don't have scale, uh, and they're having more and more leverage, and it's affecting pricing power and margins of business across the board. So the big disruptors that got the data, their margins are great, probably improving, and they can add millions of customers with not that much more investment. Think uh, Schwab and Ameritrade versus uh, other smaller companies. They've got, the, but imagine the implications for business dynamism, entrepreneurship, uh, new businesses in this country, and we are seeing that uh, in every conversation we have. It's interesting. One of the themes we've talked about in different ways this morning is the haves and the have-nots. I mentioned MBA programs. You talked about college-educated workers versus less skilled workers, and it's going to be ones with data and, and ones without, ones yeah. with scale, ones without. Uh, if for anybody in the panel, do you expect more consolidation because of this? So, what, what, Mike, on the publicly traded side, do you think we're going to see more and more combinations to get scale? There's no question. I mean, it's proven to work. Um, and, you know, a lot of the consolidation on the service provider space where we live has happened. Uh, but there will still be more of it. There's no question. And, and providers, big global companies, they, they're consolidating the number of people that they want to they manage and work with. Yeah. So I think that definitely is a, is a, is a trend. So, Mary, from your side with, with your firm, is it, you know, when, when you talk about this consolidation, all this IT spend, is it, is it the key is the partnering? I, I think the key for us is the partnering. I still think you're going to have room for investors of all sizes mm -hmm. um, because they are partnering with groups like Mike that are going to bring that level to them. I think service providers will get bigger because data becomes king. Um, and, you know, we hope to be doing deals and partnering with those groups. So I don't know that I see you know, that we, we still couldn't maintain the size that we like to find the opportunities that we have. You know, at some point you may sit back and say, yes, we have to be a, a little bit bigger, but, but, I, yeah. but I don't see it right now. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, just the returns to scale, I mean, I'm not speaking about real estate specifically here, but just companies that are driving technological innovation on the machine learning side and the robotic side. Uh, you know, I have a lot of uh, students and colleagues that, you know, either go to work for these companies or approached by these companies all the time. And you know, it's, it's almost difficult to imagine startups in those space these days having an exit strategy that doesn't involve being bought by a Google, Amazon, Facebook, or Microsoft. And it does have tremendous implications for dynamism. Jay? So the, the, the number one question businesses have to ask and, uh, is, is, what do we do that's distinctive? What, what, do, what products or services do we offer where we've got a competitive advantage, we can price and make a profit and I tell you, that question, that question's always been hard, but it's getting a lot harder. Mm -hmm. And you have to ask it more frequently, because if the answer is, well, we, this is what we do because this is what we've always done, including universities, that's you right. name it, there's not an industry that's exempt. You have to keep evolving, because what you do distinctive, a lot of it is getting uh, commoditized or scaled, where you can't make a profit anymore. That's, and it's happening business by business, Pricing power and margin, be able to protect your margins is eroding, and you've you've got to really be nimble today and forward looking. Mike, did you? I was just going to make a comment on the real estate. There's there's I think it's the the consolidation comment is really if, there's always going to be sm great small firms that are very focused on doing something. It may be a local firm or it may be you know a niche practice that 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 will always be the case. That's an opportunity. It's the ones in the middle. When you once you kind of go to a certain growth aspiration. It's almost like there's no going back. And we found that true at Trammell Crow Company. We were big in the US, but we knew we had to be global, and that's when we became part of CBRE. So I think those in the middle are the most likely to get consolidated and keep rolling up. That's, but the, the big ones always have to compete with the really good local smaller firms. That's, that's just the reality. That's interesting. So let's take questions from the crowd. Um, so if you've written something down, you can hand it up, and we'll, we'll get it up here. But you might want to start off and ask something. George, you get, you get dibs. First question. <laughs>
percent of the kids in K through 12 in the state of Texas are first generation kids. They'll be the first kids in their whole family to ever go to college. By 2050, that number is going to 85 percent. And to me, this is the most pressing problem we have because if we don't have a well trained, growing workforce, So, so we think this is a big issue for the state of Texas. We're a little bit at the cutting edge. Uh, our, our fastest growing demographic groups, uh, uh, blacks and Hispanics, have lagging educational attainment levels. And if you look at the early childhood literacy statistics, they're concerning. And, and what's the most valuable skill in talking, and, and Professor Scott can comment, what's the most valuable skill the workforce is going to need to have in the future? Literacy, ability to read, write, adaptability. AI will be increasingly accessible. And so we think nationwide, in Texas for sure, but nationwide, we need a dramatic beefing up of pre-K, expanded pre-K, we believe, early childhood literacy. Because we've got to get kids earlier, zero to five, particularly in these uh, these fastest growing demographic groups, at risk kids. And if we don't, uh, we can we can get we can deal with with them otherwise in secondary education. We've got to dramatically beef up skills training. But I'm worried that we're not getting to kids early enough, particularly the, some of the groups you just referred to. And if we don't, we're going to have lower productivity, and they're not going to be as adaptable in a world where you have to be more adaptable than we had to be uh, growing up. Yeah, great. For us, a great story that came out on UT. I don't know if you all saw it, but uh, the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation just committed $100 million uh, to UT Austin last week to help Pell Grant eligible students. Now, they're, they've already gotten in the university. They've, they've won that part of the journey, back to your point, Rob, and you're talking about you know, getting them earlier. But if they're getting to us now, we're maybe going to be more and more able to make yeah, sure they succeed at the university. But they got to get to us first. So it's a, it starts well before that, uh, to your point. Uh, so uh, some questions here on more just to build on that on uh, skill development. And you, we talked about productivity. We talked about this classes of people with and without skills. What can be done differently if you sort of zone in on how can we really tangibly get better skill development in the workforce, whether people that want to enter the real estate business, um, or people want to go on and, and do other things. You talk about literacy. Is there something concrete that, that people are asking you, know, you have in mind that could be done? Yeah, and I, I, I'll just make a comment, then we'll hear from others. But uh, we, we do a pretty good job, Dallas Community College. Uh, there's other centers in this state, Greater Houston Partnership, uh, El Paso Community College. But I will tell you, if technology and technology-enabled disruptions go on like this, skill training, uh, is improving like this, and the gap is widening. We think there's well over a million unfilled jobs in the United States for skilled workers. More than half now of all small businesses tell us in nationwide surveys and in our own surveys, they cannot find skilled workers. And so we probably need to beef up, I mean, really supercharge a national initiative. And the reason it's not happening faster, it tends to, so far it has to be done locally. So if you've got a great junior college president, you've got a great mayor, you've got a great community that encourages, which we do, it happens. But it's very uneven in the United States. So I'd say we need a national initiative to dramatically improve this. So maybe for Mike or Mary, how, how hard is it to find talent? So if you th how, how is the talent piece of what you do? Is that a constraint? Are you able to find people you need? Well, again, we're small, so it's not a huge hiring base that happens every year. But, but you know, really in our business, again, not to, it's, it, it is somewhat simple. And you're looking for people that are conversant in financial matters and somewhat conversant in accounting as well. And I think what I see, you know, based on what we're, we're learning today and, and, and what I think you're going to eventually want to have is somebody who's also conversant in data analytics. Um, and that's not something we've been hiring for, but I think that's something we're going to need to in the future. Mike? I'd say that, you know the war for talent is real and it's very very on depending on we do a lot of different things and I think that never before has diversity been more important in our industry than ever it has not been known for diversity so there's huge opportunity there and every, you know you growing up in the business you thought I used to think everybody was a broker or a developer and that's how you got in the business today it will be it's very different the skills that are coming in the skills that are needed 
ten percent of our, less than ten percent of our workforce are brokers globally. So I mean, we have engineers. I mean, the need for accounting and engineers and data scientists and all those it's it's changing the landscape. So we'll be I think the industry will look a lot different, and the the demands and the needs for skills training will come from a broader. Uh, range of, of, uh, of needs than ever before, I think. James, what do students want to do when you talk to students? Oh, they all want to disrupt, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, on some level, it's like I, I, you know, I train the soldiers. I don't send them to the Western Front. Uh, so I'm not the best equipped to, to kind of weigh in on these questions. But I mean, there has been, a, even I've been in, at the University of Texas 11 years. And there has been, even in that relatively short period of time, there's been an enormous see change in the attitude that students have towards taking a data science or a statistics class. Um, it was like pulling teeth 11 years ago, trying to get folks interested in data. Inter and that, uh, you know, that was probably very short-sighted of folks coming through that cohort. Uh, it, is, it is very obvious to my students these days that uh, there's desperate need for the kind of skills that I'm trying to equip them with. And there's just a, it, frankly, it's a lot easier to do my job than it was 11 years ago <laughs> because students are just much keener on learning those ideas. And so they, they get it, right? They feel those market pressures, and they respond, trying to equip themselves with, with what they need. So one of the, some of the questions here were around, and Rob, you alluded to the, the, the coronavirus. So what, how serious do, do we think that might be? And I don't know, uh, Mike, if you've seen anything on supply chains yet or anything um, from the global side uh, so far. So Rob, do you want to start? Uh, yeah, so listen, so far we've done, we've looked at, looked at the SARS history, other histories, and I would just, I would boil it down to this. Uh, it's too soon to tell, but we'll know in the next few weeks, if you start to see the uh, infection rates and death tolls start to flatten out, particularly the infection rates, that will tell you that in hindsight this will have turned out to be a transitory situation, and, we're, and we won't be talking about this very much six months from now. Uh, if, if, on the other hand, you see the numbers continue to build, just statistically, uh, then this is something that could be a little more persistent and go on longer. Our best judgment at this point is we don't have a reason to think that this will be different than other viruses, i.e., it will turn out to have a peak period, it will tail off. And in three to six months, we'll look back at this as something that's been transitory. That's probably still my, my best guess on what this will be. In the meantime, it has a, it's having a big effect. China is a huge part of not only global GDP, but it's a very large percentage of global growth in GDP. And you're going to see loss of consumption, loss of oil demand, <coughs> logistics, supply chain ar arrangements, or uh, you know, uh, uh, Apple closing their stores there. In the near term, it'll have a serious impact. But if it's not persistent, and it turns out to be temporary, I think this will, this, which I think is likely, this will turn out to be manageable. Mike, have anything yet? On well, I, you know, I've been on a series of calls over the last 10 days. We've closed all of our offices in China, told people to stay home. Um, and, uh, you know, obviously it, it impact, it is, certainly has short-term impact on just transactions and uncertainty. I was talking to our head of investments last night who lives in Singapore. We had a deal working in Wuhan that probably won't happen or it'll be delayed. So, I mean, it's, it's uh, I hope that that is true, that this, that we get this through this quickly, but it's uh, definitely disrupting China. All the, all the, Countries around there are watching it very closely, closing their borders, and yeah. hope there's a cure and hope we get, we get through it quick. So I've got some multiple questions here on one of the areas in real estate people talk about as being arguably most disrupted, which is retail. And you know, Mary, you, uh, you mentioned the change in industrial demand that's sort of been a substitution in some sense from retail demand, retail space demand to industrial space demand. But if you could all talk about what you're seeing in, in retail, and uh, Mike, I don't know if you want to start off, but what's how is that sector looking? And, how, how dire is the outlook, and, and yeah. what's going to well, happen? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 definitely been under pressure um, it, from all the asset classes. It's the one that has been picked on the most, for sure. If you look at Q4 stats, uh, you know, retail sales in the U.S. were up like three to four percent. But if you unpack that, the non-store retail, which is e-commerce, was up almost twenty percent, somewhere between nineteen and twenty percent. So it's getting obviously the growth is going there. Um, but there's pockets of opportunity. Uh, you know, cap rates for retail are six to eight percent. So there, you know, you'll look at kind of where it's trading. So there's, there's a, again, there's a home for it. We don't think it's going away. A lot of it's getting repurposed. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of retail, whether it's power centers, neighborhood centers are always going to do well. Um, so it's still an asset class we believe in. It, it is definitely being disrupted. But we don't think it's 
going away anytime soon. It's a, it's a big asset class in, in Europe, it's the same, the same situation, but you've gotta be attentive to it. And the connection between retail and industrial and that last mile and all the supply chain is so real and it is changing the way inventories are, are stacking up and that whole flow of, of, of business. But it's, uh, it's not going away, but it's definitely under pressure. So um, last sort of parting question. So Rob, you, you often do a good job of thinking about what are the two or three things you're looking for. So if you look to the rest of 2020, what, what's on your mind as indicators that, that you're thinking are coming or things you'll be watching for? So I'm going to just look for, uh, we, we know the household sector and the consumer in the United States is in good shape. We've got a record low unemployment rate. Uh, all measures of, of utilization are very tight. So, so what could disrupt it? Or what could de derail it? Uh, one, further weakness, surprise weakness in global growth. So I'll be looking at that. Surprise weakness in manufacturing and surprise weakness in business fixed investment. So I'm watching those very carefully because I know the consumer's in pretty good shape and it would take weakness in those, first th those three sectors to seep into the rest of the economy. Right now, I'm hopeful that won't happen, but that's probably what I'll be watching for in particular. And then uh, uh, these longer term drivers are not something to watch in 2020, but they're still the primary things I look at. Growth in the workforce, are we making policy changes to grow productivity? That's ultimately uh, the policies that will prevail. But for 2020, it'll be those, those shorter term factors. Do you expect any hesitancy uh, to invest with the election approaching? People waiting for uncertainty to be resolved? <laughs> well, uh, I'm not asking for forecasting election. No, I know that. Just uncertain. I, I figured that. Uh, uh, it, it depends. It depends on, on what the probability weighting is. And my guess is by the middle of this year, people will make a probability judgment about what's the most likely outcome. And sure, is it, 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 there's going to be some hesitancy uh, in a number of different industries. If there's uncertainty, sure, that'll have some impact. Yeah. Okay, we're out of time. I, I want to say thanks to our panelists. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we are continuing trying to, to tweak these. If there's topics you want to see us address or people you'd like to see us uh, try to lure on the stage, let one of us know. If you haven't been connected back to the university in a bit and you want to be, we've got a big team. Any, anybody from UT want to raise your hand? Lots of us in the room. So tap to one of us, and we'd love to get you back to campus and come see our students. So thank you all for coming out. Have a good day. Hope and morning.